In this video, we'll begin a new phase of our course where we focus on classification. Instead of building models to predict a quantitative response, we'll build models to predict categorical responses. A classic tool for modeling binary responses is logistic regression. We're still in the supervised learning branch of our course where we have output variables that we model as functions of predictors, but the branch of supervised learning that deals with modeling categorical variables is called classification because the predictions made from these models are used to put cases into different classes. Why do we need special models for categorical variables? Let's consider an illustrative situation. Suppose we want to model the medical condition of a patient based on the symptoms that they're presenting with. And suppose that there are three possible outcomes, infection with bacteria type one, two, or three. Further, Suppose that we wanted to use linear regression to do this modeling. We would have to turn medical condition from a categorical variable to a quantitative variable. We could do this by calling this response Y and assigning the numbers one to three for the three types of bacteria. The problem with this is that it implies an ordering to the three types of infection. For some reason, we have implied that infection two is more severe than one and that infection three is more severe than both one and two. Even if one is the least severe and three is the most severe, the exactly one unit difference between outcomes doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. The problem with linear regression for classification is that it is not tailored for dealing with categorical variables, but a technique called logistic regression is. linear regression, the response variable itself was the quantity being modeled on the left-hand side of model formulas. In logistic regression, only binary categorical variables can be modeled. We use y equals 1 and y equals 0 to represent the two conditions, which might, for example, represent the diseased and non-diseased conditions, respectively. And instead of modeling the response variable y itself, we model the log odds of the y equals 1 event. The log odds of this event is the natural logarithm of the odds of the event. And the odds of the event is the probability of the event happening divided by one minus that probability. In other words, in logistic regression, we model the log odds of an event as a linear combination of the predictors. Just as with linear regression, statistical software gives us values for the beta coefficients when we fit such a model, and it also gives us quantities for performing statistical inference, such as p-values, test statistics, and confidence intervals. Let's look at an example. We have data on the financial and personal characteristics of several individuals and whether or not they defaulted on the loan. We're interested in modeling the chances of defaulting as a function of credit card balance. This is expressed by the logistic regression model shown here. When we fit this model, we get estimates of negative 10.65 and 0 0.0055 for beta zero and beta one. Let's go over what these numbers mean. The intercept beta zero is interpreted as a baseline log odds, the log odds of defaulting when all predictors are zero. So the log odds of defaulting when credit card balance is zero dollars is negative 10.65. This means that the odds of defaulting is e to the negative 10.65. Because odds and probabilities are related by simple formulas, we can convert this odds to a probability. So the probability of an individual defaulting on their loan, given a credit card balance of $0, is quite small. Note that we should be cautious when interpreting intercepts because sometimes setting all predictors to zero is senseless. Here, a credit card balance of $0 is realistic, but for quantitative predictors such as height and weight, zero values make no sense. In this case, interpreting the intercept amounts to extrapolation. Let's move to the beta one coefficient. The beta one coefficient is interpreted as a change in log odds or the logarithm of an odds ratio. To see why, let's use our general model formula to predict the log odds of defaulting for two cases who differ in their credit card balance by $1. We see that the difference in these two predicted log odds 
is equal to beta 1. A difference in logs is equal to the log of the ratio, so this is why beta 1 is interpreted as the natural logarithm of an odds ratio. So, e to the beta 1 represents an odds ratio. The two odds being compared in this odds ratio are the odds of defaulting for two cases who differ by $1 in their credit card balance. The fact that the beta 1 coefficient is positive and the odds ratio is greater than 1 indicates that as credit card balance increases, the probability, odds, and log odds of defaulting on a loan increase. Let's look at another example where we modeled the log odds of defaulting as a function of both credit card balance and whether or not the individual is a student. Student yes is an indicator variable that is one if the individual is a student and zero if not. When we fit this model, we get the estimated logistic regression model formula at the bottom. The intercept, the intercept is still interpreted as a baseline log odds when all predictor variables in the model have a value of zero. So negative 10.75 is this baseline log odds for a non-student with a credit card balance of zero. We convert to odds and then to probability as before. The probability of such an individual defaulting on a loan is very low. The coefficient on balance, beta 1, will be interpreted as a log odds ratio, as in our previous example. But with the inclusion of the student variable, the interpretation will change slightly. We'll compare two cases whose credit card balances differ by $1, but who are otherwise the same. Let's say that they are both students. We can predict the log odds of defaulting for these two cases and we see that the difference in these log odds is the beta 1 coefficient. We would see the same result if both cases were non-students. So beta 1 is interpreted as a log odds ratio holding constant student status. In the context of our actual numbers, e to the beta 1 represents an odds ratio rather than a log odds ratio. There are many ways to express in words what this odds ratio of 1.0057 means. Let's look at two examples. We can say that this is the odds ratio of defaulting, comparing two cases whose credit card balance differs by $1, holding constant student status. We can also say, fixing whether or not someone is a student, a $1 increase in credit card balance multiplies the odds of defaulting by 1.0057. We can use a similar process to determine the interpretation of the beta 2 coefficient. We see that beta 2 is a log odds ratio comparing a student to a non-student but who have identical credit card balances. Using our estimates from the model, we see that the odds ratio is 0.489. We can express this in words as this is the odds ratio of defaulting, comparing a student in the numerator to a non-student in the denominator, holding constant credit card balance. We can also express this as fixing credit card balance. A student has 0.489 times the odds of defaulting than a non-student. That is, for a fixed credit card balance, students are less likely to default than non-students. We focused on interpreting coefficients in the logistic regression model so far, but now let's look at how we can use this model to make hard predictions about whether someone will default on their loan. Let's say that some new individual has a credit card balance of 1900 and is not a student. We can predict their log odds of defaulting directly from the model, and from there, the odds and probability of defaulting. The predicted probability is greater than 0.5. We are predicting that this person is more likely to default than not, also indicated by the odds being greater than one. So it's reasonable to predict that this person will default given a probability threshold of 0.5. Let's look at another individual. This person has the same credit card balance, but is a student. We see from the negative coefficient for student 
that being a student makes an individual less likely to default, holding constant credit card balance. And as expected, the predicted probability of default is about 0.35 for this person, much lower than for person one. Because this predicted probability is less than our threshold of 0.5, we'll predict that this person won't default. So what we've done for these two hypothetical people is use our logistic regression model to predict a probability of the outcome of interest happening. And then we threshold that predicted probability to make a hard prediction about the outcome happening or not. Were these predictions correct? We need to compare our predictions to actual outcomes. Let's look at common accuracy metrics for classification. To do this, it'll be helpful to organize our predictions and the true outcomes in a neat way. A common way of displaying this information is with a table that is called a confusion matrix in the machine learning literature. In a confusion matrix, we display the true outcome on one side of the table. Here, this is displayed along the columns, and we display our predictions on the other side, here along the rows. This confusion matrix is the result of us using a 0.5 probability threshold for the logistic regression model that we just looked at. Common terminology is to call predictions of yes as positives and predictions of no as negatives. So the errors in this table are the counts of 39 and 228. The 39 are called false positives because we falsely made a positive prediction. We falsely made a prediction of yes, although the actual response was no. The 228 are called false negatives because we falsely made a negative prediction. We falsely made a prediction of no, although the actual response was yes. The other two counts are cases of correct predictions and are called true positives and true negatives. With this terminology in hand, let's discuss some common accuracy metrics. Overall accuracy is the total fraction of correct predictions, true positives plus true negatives over the total number of cases. Our logistic regression model for loan defaults has a high accuracy of 97.33%. But note that this overall accuracy has been computed on the training data. Just as in regression tasks, we might be prone to overfitting and overestimating the quality of the model if we just look at training set performance. We'll return to cross-validation for estimating the true accuracy once we cover the rest of the accuracy measures. Another common metric is sensitivity. Sensitivity is a class-specific accuracy measure that gives the percentage of true yeses that are predicted to be yes. In this case, it's the percentage of actual defaulters whom we predict to default. There are 333 people who defaulted, but we only detected 105 of them, or 31.53%. Finally, we have specificity. Specificity is another class-specific accuracy measure. It gives the percentage of true no's that are predicted to be no. In this case, it's the percentage of actual non-defaulters whom we predict to not default. There are 9,667 people who did not default, and we detected 9,628 of them, or 99.6%. It looks like our model is better at accurately predicting non-defaulters than defaulters, but as we just discussed, these metrics have all been computed on the training data. We should use cross-validation to get a better picture of this model's performance. Tenfold cross-validation will look as follows for the classification situation, and it's completely analogous to the regression setting. We split the training data into 10 folds or subsets. In each iteration, we hold out one fold for evaluating the accuracy of our model and use the remaining nine folds for training our logistic regression model with the balance and student predictors. Overall, there are 10 iterations for each possible validation fold and we get 10 estimated accuracies. We average these to get an estimate of the tr true accuracy on unseen data.
the test accuracy. In summary, we've introduced a new tool called logistic regression that can be used to model binary variables in terms of predictors. The direct output we get from logistic re regression models are log odds of the event of interest. These log odds can be converted to probabilities in two steps, and we can use thresholds on these probabilities to make hard predictions. We can compare these hard predictions to the actual observed classes for the training cases in order to compute overall and class-specific accuracy measures. As with regression, cross-validation will be our ally in classification settings to get fair estimates of test error, fair estimates of our model's performance on new data.